Okay, you should be seeing my initial slide here. I, I, I'm really actually very excited to be here and I was certainly excited to learn how many people had registered for this. And I know that some people, uh, I invited a bunch of people myself actually, because I used to live on the peninsula and um, I have a lot of friends that uh, are down in that area. And I know people that elsewhere that might be interested in, in hearing about this. So I think one of, the, one of the things we have to thank for the great turnout is that wonderful article that came out. And for thanks to uh, Roz and John for sharing their challenges um, with the writer of that article. And I think that's probably what brought a lot of you here today. I initially, got started thinking about solo aging about 10 years ago. And it happened kind of in an interesting way. As Paula mentioned, I am a solo ager, but I didn't even know that until one day when I was having a glass of wine with a very good friend of mine, Sandy, she lives down in the South Bay and we were in Palo Alto having a glass of wine at one of those wonderful little wine bars. And she was, telling me a lot about the last year of her life where he, she had spent a tremendous amount of time flying back and forth to the East Coast, trying to care for her mom, who was at that point in her late 80s. And she was starting to struggle a little bit. She was struggling with driving. She couldn't go out and, and do her own shopping as much as she had was used to doing. And she couldn't she couldn't go out to lunch with her friends and she was missing a lot of those things. And I think she was missing the company that Sandy could provide if she lived a little closer. So Sandy was on an airplane more than she would have liked going back and forth. And coincidentally, that same morning, I had had about an hour long phone call with a, another friend of mine who lives down in Morgan Hill. And she had told me about her travels back and forth to the East Coast also to take care of an aging parent, this time her father-in-law. So at one point in that discussion, I looked at Sandy and I said, you know, you and I don't have kids. Who's going to do that for us? And we looked at each other and took a, another big gulp of that nice Cabernet we were having <laughs> and realized that there was no answer. And there was born the idea for me to look at solo aging. I hadn't even put a term to it <clears throat> at that point. I think I started calling it solo aging a year or so later. But that's how I came to realize that I was a solo ager and that so many people that I knew also were solo agers. So I started to dig into that somewhere around 2013. And I discovered, thanks to a research study that had been done in 2010. Now, 2010 was about the time that the... the um, youngest baby boomers were just crossing that threshold out of childbearing years. And they did a study to see how many boomers had had children compared to previous generations. And you can see from this chart how, how much it had grown. It had almost doubled. Previous generations, for lots of reasons, had only had about 10% childless. And I think a lot of that wasn't due to choice. But if you think back to what was happening in the late 60s and into the 70s, it's no mystery why baby boomers had fewer kids. The biggest reason, of course, is we had the pill and women had lots more choice about what to do with their lives. They could choose to get married or not. They didn't need a man to support them anymore. They didn't have quite as much pressure as their parents had had to have children and become a mom. So... Things changed. Things changed a lot for boomers. And then things changed a lot for me when the, uh, the most recent census resulted in a study that came out just a few months ago, actually, just September of last year. Uh -oh, I have some interference here. <laughs> um, Bill, can you Bill, can you please mute? Oh, I think we're good. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So last year, a study came out from the Census Bureau. And for the very first time, our U.S. Census Bureau actually had studied and reported on childlessness in older adults. 
And this chart tells the whole tale. It has grown tremendously as we knew, but now we have actual numbers to put to it. And if you take away that light blue chart on the right hand side, if you take away those 2.2 million that are older than boomers, you can see where the kind of the average percentage for boomers between the early boomers and the late ones is somewhere around 17, 17 and a half percent, again, childless. Now, I suspect some of you are already thinking, oh, is she just going to talk about childlessness? I'm not. I certainly recognize because of lots of feedback that I got when I started talking about solo aging and saying, well, that solo agers are childless people. And people told me, no, no, no. There's a lot more of us out there that are solo agers than just those that don't have children. Actually, I like to call us child free. Anyway, there's lots of other categories. And these are the ones that I hear about the most. Yes, there's a, a group of us that don't have children, but there's also a lot of people out there, especially in this day and age, that have children who live very far away. I have a neighbor, Judy, who lives just down the street from me. We've become good friends and we try and get out for a walk every day. And she is a mom. She has a son and she's about 36, but he married a woman from Denmark and they live in Denmark and they're raising a family in Denmark. And Judy's life is here. So is she a solo ager? She and her husband? Yeah, I think they are. And of course, then we've got people who have kids and other family members that are dysfunctional in some way. <laughs> um, we have solo agers who's, who are estranged from their kids or estranged from all of the rest of their family. So we've got all kinds of conditions that kind of create um, create solo aging. So I'm going to actually uh, throw this at, uh, <laughs> throw this back to our social workers now. And uh, Paula, do you have any questions in the chat that you'd like to share now or, or include any yeah. other comments that have come up? So, yeah, so um... There are comments going on, and I think it expresses a lot of feelings about um, the idea of solo aging, who is or is not, how is it defined, but also how it impacts people's identity and self-esteem in the sense of being less than. And I am a solo ager. I don't have any children, um, not married. And sometimes I joke about celebrating that and having a, a party because I've gone to so many other people's parties all lives for weddings, birthdays, honoring this, that. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to register at Bloomingdale's and <laughs> get some housewares or something. Um, and there was an episode of Sex in the City about that, where Carrie did throw herself a party to get some shoes, and she was a solo ager. So I think this is a, a, a topic that's very emotional about how we think about ourselves and our self-esteem and our, and our identity. And it can mean many different things for different people, but it certainly doesn't mean we are less than anybody else. And we are very valuable, whether we're volunteers or helping a friend raise their child or the honorary godparent or aunt. I mean, there's so many ways to define ourselves and to be in, in this world. Um, we did have a question about, um, related to this topic and to children about that if, and it has to do with proxy decision making, and it comes up all the time, right? Especially during the pandemic. Um, who, if we don't have children, and I'm dealing with this too, if you don't have a child, who's going to be your proxy decision maker if you start to develop memory loss or some sort of impairment, and you're aware of that, and you don't have anybody in your present life? And I promise all of you that is something that I am going to address in another town hall. And there are people out there who take these roles on. A lot of them are um, professional fiduciaries. They've signed up with the county courts. They're trained. But I want to talk about the red flags and the red alerts about that process and how to find somebody to bring on board that you can trust. Now, Roz, in the Palo Alto Weekly article, which was last Friday, I'm sorry I didn't post the exact link, but if you Google Palo Alto Weekly online, solo aging, the um, author is Chris Kenrick, who covers a lot of Avenida's programs and events, it will show up. But that's an uh, issue that um, Roz has discussed in the Monday Caregiver Group, because she's actually a caregiver 
um, for her husband and part of the, the issues that surfaced during the pandemic among a lot of caregivers, people who are married, if I should die first or something happens to me, then my infirm, frail person is alone and who's gonna take care of them? So that set my group on a mission. We do homework in my Monday caregiver group, looking at resources for, for people yeah. in that situation. And so people are posting that sometimes, you know, life changes and you become a solo ager because your loved one has died or you have divorced, or you may have five, six children all over the world working in other countries and you wish them well and you want them to go have their lives. And all of a sudden, you know, a few months into this, you've fallen down, you've broken your hip and, or you have fractured yourself and you're in the emergency room and they're sending you home, especially if it's a fracture, they're not going to keep you. And all of a sudden you're wondering who's going to care for you. And then my phone rings here at Avenue because somebody's looking for help or home care. So this is an, a huge conversation with many, many, many different uh, pieces to it. And so I'm, I'm really happy to see your comments in the chat line of, of, about this question. And I think the proxy decision maker is a, is a very significant question. Yes, it's certainly a question that has come up many times in the, uh, the groups that I've led and, and um, people ask it and it's a, it's a very sticky wicket. Um, and that's one of the biggest reasons why I want to encourage people to plan early because they can think about that, to develop some resources where they do have proxies, potential proxies. Now, for most people, I, I'm going to go on and talk a little a bit now about our social networks, because a lot of this does revolve around our own social networks and whatever they may look like. The social network of a parent is so very different than the social network of a solo ager. Now, everybody's social network looks different. And for those of you out there who are parents, this may or may not look like yours. The parents that I've known who have kids and grandkids, especially locally, have a social network that looks something like this. And you can see that most of the arrows, most of the ties are from that parent through their children, to their grandchildren, including their, their children and grandchildren's friends and spouses and in-laws. And it revolves so much about, around that family system. Less so, as you can see toward the right, or sorry, toward the left, with community and lower to friends. Contrast that with, with the social network of a, so, of a typical solo ager. And generally speaking, the ties that solo oh, agers have, oh dear, <laughs> the ties that solo agers have are primarily with their community, with their friends. Oh dear, I wonder. That's the dog. I see somebody that's not muted, I'm gonna mute them. If you guys who are on with me look through the group, you can see where other people are muted. I think that's Lois. Lois, are you on mute? Oh, I'm gonna mute her. She's muted now. Okay. Okay. You can mute each of these people individually if you hover over their square. Right. So, okay. So anyway, back to the social network of a solo ager, it often looks like this. Many solo agers have nieces and nephews. Some of them have family that lives close by, siblings. Some of us don't. Solo agers are typically much more involved with their community than parents are. Parents are so involved with their families, they often don't have the kind of time that solo agers do to give back, to volunteer, uh, to to use their community resources to participate in their community, even to the point of uh, politically participate. So it looks, it looks, oh dear. Lois needs to mute. Well, let's mute her again. Oh, okay, she's muted now. <laughs> um, so it looks very different than than the soul, than a parent who has a lot of family related ties. Now, 
I have one friend who was the youngest girl of five girls in a family. And I actually grew up with this family. And my one friend, Linda, is about my age and the rest of her sisters are older. But Linda, unlike her sisters, did not go on to have children. She didn't marry. She became a scientist and ended up traveling the world. And in fact, her, the last 13 years of her career life, she spent in the Galapagos. But Linda did a very good job of staying in touch with her family. And her social network did revolve more around her family because she had developed those relationships with her nieces and nephews through her siblings. In fact, who wouldn't want to have an Aunt Linda that was living in the Galapagos that invited you to come spend a month there during your summer vacation? So she did. And I tease her today that she is the solo ager that isn't. So we have all kinds of, of degrees of solo aging. We have a whole spectrum of what our different social networks look like, but it is very different than those who do have family. Now, I also want to make one other point, and that's, that came out in the uh, census, actually, that more adults that are child-free live alone. Now, living alone is not a bad thing. In fact, research that's been done on people who live alone found that they, throughout midlife, during their career years, people are very happy living alone, especially women. And I've certainly seen that myself. I spent a few years living on my own before I got married again. And I have known many, many women and still know many women who are very happy living alone. However, that can change as we get older. And the reason it changes is because we, we change as we get older. We don't think we're going to, but we do. And we have to watch out for isolation. And that is the risk of living alone as you get older is isolation leading to loneliness. And I suspect that almost everybody on this call has read some of the the articles that have come out about the research that's been done on loneliness and the, the, uh, the risk of loneliness for people that live alone and how isolation can actually be a greater risk to cutting our life short than smoking or heart disease. So I'm not a big fan for that reason of what's commonly known as aging in place. I like the idea of aging in the right place and that can be a lot of places, but it sure doesn't seem to me like the right place is in your two or three story house that you've lived in for 40 years on a cul-de-sac somewhere where you barely know your neighbors. So I want to spend a lot of time talking about social networks. And I think that a, a lot of the work that, you, that you'll end up doing later, hopefully with Paula and some of her crew at Avenidas, will also revolve around setting up and developing your own support networks. This can be more challenging as we get older. But all of the things you see on this list can help. And I hope that many of you who are listening to this have done this, have done many of these things already. And if you haven't, put a few on your to-do list and get busy developing your social network. I had a wonderful example of how important social networks are during the pandemic, as I think many of us probably had our, our, our first experience with actual isolation and loneliness. Even if we did live with someone, it can be lonely living with just one person and not seeing anybody else. So one time during the pandemic, I think it was about a month in, probably sometime in April, late April, there was a wonderful story in a local paper up in Santa Rosa that I think may have hit your, your newspapers too. I think it may have hit the Mercury News and the Chronicle about a guy in Petaluma who decided that he needed to make contact somehow. And he went out on his deck and he, about dusk and he howled. He just howled. Oh, oh. 
like a lone wolf looking for a mate or just letting other wolves in the area know he was there. Well, we did this for a couple nights and pretty soon people started howling back. There were people going out on their porches and decks and out their front doors and howling. Well, that seemed like a pretty good idea to me. So I said to my husband at the breakfast table when I read this article, I said, we're gonna go out and howl tonight. And of course, initially he thought I was really nuts. I'd really lost it. And until he read the article and he said, okay, cause he's pretty game for things like that. So sure enough, we did it. We went out in the middle of our cul-de-sac and we howled. Now, we didn't know a lot of our neighbors cause we had only lived there about a year and a half at that time. So, uh, but out they came to see what all the noise was about. And they started howling too. And pretty soon that howling led to happy hour. It led to some bring your own dinners. And eventually it led to movie night. And now we have a wonderful community in our neighborhood. And I would say it took the pandemic to do that or it took howling to do that. <laughs> but <laughs> we really enjoyed the opportunity to get to know one another. So whatever it takes to build a community, it's an important thing to do. Now your social network will look something like this. Everybody's potential support system looks something like this. You've got a lot of different people that you've probably known for many years. Some of them are family, some of them aren't, but this is what every this is what a midlife person's social support system looks like. But as we get older, some of these bubbles start to shrink and some of them even disappear. Now, we don't really know in what order they're going to disappear or shrink, but as surely as we're all sitting here, they will shrink if you don't guard against it. And what happens is we end up with something like this if we're not careful, that the only real relationships we have are with our doctors, our caregivers, and other people that we pay to come in and help us. And I don't know about you, but I would rather my support system, I'd rather my life look something like this. So as you are thinking about your own support system, and before I toss this back to Paul, let's see if we have other comments. Um, think about your own support system and think about how, how sticky are those people in your support system? Are they liable to stay there or are they liable to leave? Now, one of the, the, one of the hazards that solo agers run into, and I imagine some of you have experienced this, I have, is that people we've known for many years and we think are going to be our friends for life, they live next door or they live down the street or they belong to our church or synagogue and we're really close to them. One day, probably somewhere in their 60s or early 70s, they announce they're moving. Why are they moving? Because they're not solo agers. They've got kids somewhere and those grandkids are starting to come along and they want to be near them. So away they go without a backward glance. And all of a sudden you're looking at a hole in your life because someone has left. So when I ask you to think about how sticky are the people in your lives, think about how likely they are to stick around and ask them how likely they are to stick around. I know a number of my friends are planning on moving in the near future. I don't know if part of that is moving out of California. You know what's been going on in my area in Santa Rosa. Um, but a lot of it is to be near, near children. And of course, solo agers also may choose to move somewhere where they're nearer to family. And that can be a good thing, but it's something to give very, very serious and long thought to. So Paula, what do we have now in the chat? Do we have new questions or comments? Yes, we have, a, and we have interesting dialogue going on. So first of all, I wanna talk about um, programs that exist and the way we talk about this. So usually at Avenidis and when we have these Zooms, and I'm gonna be very honest in our most of our social groups, mostly it's women who do show up and not as many men. But we do have programs where we have, for instance, um, walking groups. And um, Thomas runs the LGBTQ community and he has, he has various walking groups. Um, Sierra Club has walking groups. People are asking for how to connect. 
I mean, some of the all, overall looking at the questions coming in is so, so what do we do to connect? So there are senior centers in each community. There's the YMCAs and all of it's been, you know, remote now by the pandemic. We have a Chinese cultural community. So if you Google what's of interest to you, truthfully online or in the meetup um, websites, you're gonna find like-minded people. So I, I, tell, I recommend people also just look at what's of personal of interest to you and see if you can find other people wanting to do that, whether it's a photography group going out shooting together or a book club or a wine club. Now, Avenidas offers all of this, but it's true. Most of you, some of you don't live nearby, um, but there are senior centers and in, in, in Jewish community centers and all kinds of groups within your communities. You have to be willing to, to search and look and ask. Thomas, do you have any comments about this? You wanna unmute? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, I think this is all great advice that Sarah is giving. Um, one thing I would add to it um, is that um, there is a definite investment that you have to expect to, to give um, in order to develop these relationships. Um, um, I know sometimes you'll go into a new situation, a new environment, maybe join a, a group or club and the first day or two, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't get along with any of these people. I couldn't imagine like uh, developing relationships with these people. You need to get past that um, because um, it takes time. Relationships don't happen overnight, but that's what you need um, in order to thrive as a solo ager. Because basically, you, you, we need people in our lives, right? We're we're social beings, we're social creatures. We need that support, um, and in. And as uh, Sarah mentioned, sometimes those bubbles, they start to decrease or, or fade, those, those social support bubbles in there. Um, so my advice would be to keep investing in those bubbles, um, um, create those relationships um, with people, even if it's difficult that time, because I know sometimes as we get older, we sort of um, lose that, 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 I don't know, that ability to to just uh, tolerate things and be like, oh, I don't want to deal with that. Um, but but you know what, you, you just got to get past that because you, you can't develop these relationships without investing some time, some effort, some real, um, uh, some real dedication to that relationship, right? And, and, it's, and, and it can't be one-sided either, right? Sometimes people, um, you know, well, I'm the older one, I, I like, why don't they help me? Well, sometimes you need to, help them with something, then they help you with something, then you develop that relationship. And another thing I'd like to mention is communication is key. As you get older, don't be afraid to have these conversations with your friends, such as, hey, I'm a solo ager, you're a solo ager. You wanna be my DPOA? Do you want to, uh, can, you know, after you've developed those relationships and, you, and you're building that trust, have that open communication with them that express your concerns about being a solo ager and how together, you guys can support each other um, as you as you age. Um, Thank you, Thomas, for that. Um, I, I want to piggyback on because there's some chat going on, Thomas, from you generated more chat. So the Avenida's Village is has grown during the pandemic because a lot of solo agers did join and there's many benefits and many services. Um, for solo aging through village programs. Now there's a village program in Foster City and they're starting to develop. And actually you can, you can develop these kinds of programs in your neighborhoods and you can try and link in with other people through, through the computer and, and create your own programs. Um, so, it's, so we're limited in a way by our imaginations is, is one of my favorite sayings. So how much are you willing to put it in, into the effort to, to meet other people? And um, so all of this is true. And I live actually in alternative housing. I live with 13 people in an intentional community. If somebody wants to talk to me about that, it's like, it's a challenge. I'd be happy to talk about it. There are people, I know there are people um, gathering with small groups of friends and looking at living together, buying property together. And how do we do that? There's uh, a couple in Berkeley, um, Reigns and his wife, Betsy Cohn, C-O-H-E-N, and they do co-housing coaching. So if you to Google co-housing coaching, if you're thinking of doing this, it, it already exists. There are people who will, who will help solo agers create that kind of housing and teach you about land and zones and what things to look out for. Um, so there is a lot of work already being done in this, both regarding housing and social connection. 
and we will we will continue to talk about this um, process with future programming. And, and so I am going to survey you, and I do want you to let me know what you are interested in. Now, it has come up again in the chat line about the durable power of attorney situation. Um, Sarah, do you want to go on, or do you want me to talk a little bit more about that? Uh, we've had some more questions about about uh, what what is a DPOA. Some people don't even know what that means. Yeah, I don't want to stray too much into that territory, but let me get through these last few slides because I want to talk about housing a little bit too, and then we'll just okay. totally open it up, and I'll okay. I'll come out from behind my slides and we'll we'll get some questions yeah. answered. Okay, and Bill, we'll get to your question about assisted living. Um, that's one of my areas. Okay. All right. So the big question always comes up, not just for solo wages, but for everyone. <clears throat> Where will you live? What's the best place to live? I've already told you I am not a fan of aging in, in place. If it means aging in that big home with, um, without a walk-in shower and without grab bars and without wide doorways. And I know that a lot of you live in lovely homes that you've been in for a very long time. It's the peninsula is a lovely place to be. However, <clears throat> there is life beyond the peninsula. There's life beyond California. There's even life beyond the borders of the US. And especially for those of you who are very, very concerned about money. But there's a lot of considerations that can be, um, a, lot of, a lot of housing opportunities <clears throat> that can be entered into really very close to where you are. Um, Paula mentioned intentional living and co-housing. I'm a huge fan of co-housing. I have a lot of friends that live in the Mountain View co-housing community, and I think a couple of them may even be uh, in this meeting. There, I've also become a huge fan of mobile home parks. Now, there used to be some lovely mobile home parks on the peninsula, but of course, land got too expensive and the people that own the property sold them and now they've been developed. I'm not sure that there are any anymore at all, but very close to the Bay Area, closely uh, on the outskirts of it, you have beautiful mobile home parks. And some of the happiest solo agers I've ever run into live in these mobile home parks. I didn't even know about them until about six or seven years ago, I was started making a series of presentations at senior centers um, up here in the North County where, where I live up in, um, I live in Sonoma County, but I was also doing programs in Napa County. And lots of people would come from these mobile home parks and they'd talk about the opportunities that they had to build community. They had community centers, they had a pool, they had, they saw each other every day when they got their, when they got their mail. A lot of them didn't have a washer and dryer in their units, so they had a communal um, laundry room that they all used. It was a, I, I became a fan. So there are, there are possibilities out there beyond where you're living. There's also possibilities right where you're living. Home sharing has become very, very popular across the country. And what that usually looks like is the Golden Girls. I imagine there's no one on this in this meeting that has not seen an episode of the Golden Girls. Somewhere along the line, I think I've seen them all. And you know what's interesting about the Golden Girls? You, we think of them because most of us watched that show when we were much younger. We were in our 30s or maybe 40s. And it looked like four older women living together, right? But those women at that time spanned a 30-year gap. You had the, the, char the Maud character, I forget her actual name, uh, who was about 60, 62 at the time. And then you had her mother played by Estelle Getty who was clearly in her 90s. So they were a multi-generational group. And I, if you can't tell already, I'm very much in favor of multi-generational groups. And I think that one of the greatest chances we have for finding people to be our proxies for healthcare and for our finances is to engage in multi-generational, engage into multi-generational life, whether or not you have nieces and nephews or um, family, younger family members somewhere, they're certainly candidates. 
but the, um, the opportunity to find younger people to engage with is absolutely available and out there. And I think that uh, Avenidis is probably um, gonna, gonna facilitate a lot of that for those who, who want it. So whatever it looks like for you, I hope that you will consider not aging alone. We're social animals and we need to be around other people to thrive. So as you think about where you're gonna live, think about a lot, think outside the box, as they say, think outside what you have just assumed you would do. Even if you simply sell that big old home and move into a condo that's one level, you've made a step in the right direction. There are beautiful 55 plus communities um, all, all over the kind of the outer Bay area. I think the one that's closest to, uh, to us here on the peninsula is uh, the villages over in East San Jose. We have a lovely one up in Santa Rosa. They're all over the place. They have, you'd, you still live on your own, but you have an opportunity to participate in a kind of a ready-made community. Anyway, those are, those are some of the many opportunities to not age all by yourself. So once again, the important, the important thing here is to grow your community, grow your friends as family community. That's for solo agers, that's gonna be at where it's at as we get older. And I, one of the things that I hope to do this year uh, that I intend to do is to foster some projects. I, I tentatively call them solo support circles. And I'd like to do that through senior centers, through synagogues, churches. I think they'll need a physical home because what I'd like to see in these solo support circles is people actually finding their proxies. And I'd love to see people coming into these circles in their 50s so that they can kind of pay it forward and help people that are in their 80s and stay with the support circle so that the, then they will have that support as they grow older. So with that, I'm gonna turn it, I'm gonna turn off, oh no, I'm not. I have one more slide to show you. Paula said, make sure I have a contact slide. And there it is. That is a picture of the book that I wrote. It came out in 2018. It's very available through Amazon. And that's my contact information. So I'll leave that up for a couple minutes and then I'll turn off my slides and I'm gonna turn it back over to Paula to field some questions. So Sarah, why don't we, somebody asked this question and I think it's good if you've got one in your book or one handy, kind of a checklist to go through. I mean, you've talked about it in your slides, but people are asking a lot of questions about, um, about modifying the home. And I know you, I looked at your, I know you have a checklist on that about traveling as a solo person. I know there are travel companies designed for different groups of people. I know there's one for women. I know there's one for lesbians. I'm sure there's, you know, for, 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 for gay men. I think everything we can think of to tell you the truth folks, if you Google it, somebody's already thought of it and there's a resource out there. And, and, and that's what I do. But then we get, um, the, what I call the crossover question. So people who are mobility impaired and need housing um, and are solo aging, what, do, what can we talk about for them? And that would get us into memory care and assisted living and places that do exist, but as everybody here knows, they cost money, they're, they're, they're very expensive. Um, and then we were being asked questions about low income housing. So I actually asked Thomas to come on board for those of you who are challenged financially, and I know that may not be the majority, but I'm gonna ask people to be patient. I want Thomas to talk a little bit about some of the resources here in Santa Clara County for folks who have are challenged financially, but also he is going to be doing in March a town hall and some workshops on how do you find affordable housing in our area. So Thomas, I just wanna throw this to you for a moment. Yeah, thank you, Paula. Um, yeah, so I'm excited that um, Sarah brought up uh, the house sharing um, option. Um, house sharing is, is a great opportunity for um, people who um, have extra space in their home. They're, they're living alone in this, in this large house. You have some extra bedrooms. Um, 
house sharing is a great opportunity for them to, to not only gain some extra income because they could um, uh, rent out that room to somebody and get a little extra income if they're just uh, relying on social security um, uh, for their day-to-day -day bills and whatnot. It's a great little boost that you can get, but also the house sharing programs, the, the way they're designed is to not only fill space in a room, but fill space in your life, right? So um, they try and match people with similar interests, backgrounds um, um, to make a, a good match to where um, it's not just a tenant landlord situation where people are doing their own thing, but they actually sort of engage with each other. Maybe they have dinner together. Maybe they um, watch some TV together or they'll, they'll go on an outing together. Um, it's to also to develop those relationships because you know the, the, the benefit is not only a financial one, but it's a overall well-being one because when you when you live alone, um, your chances of cognitive decline is greater than if you are engaged with um, somebody on a daily basis where you're having conversations, you're using your brain to think. Um, if you're just sitting in the house by yourself and you're just watching TV and you're not talking to anybody, that actually contributes to cognitive decline. Um, so it's very important to, to look at the whole picture um, of the benefits of um, uh, house sharing. Um, if you did have a, a, a room in your home and you would consider um, a house sharing um, situation, I encourage you to reach out to me. Um, we're collaborating with an agency called Roomily, which is an organization that connects um, people um, in house sharing um, uh, situations. And there right now, they're offering a free um, video workshop called House Sharing 101. Um, and if you're interested in looking at that video, getting more information about how to become, um, uh, how to participate in the house sharing program, um, please reach out to me. My email is in the chat right now. Um, and I can connect you with, um, with that organization and, and, um, and sort of guide you through the process. Um, um, and as far as regular housing, low-income housing, there's no easy way to say it. It's a, it's a challenge um, to find low-income housing. And that's another thing that we could help you with. We do offer free case management um, to older adults, especially solo agers, and helping them connect to community resources um, and, um, and uh, just sort of help them navigate all these processes, whether you need help finding housing or finding um, medical resources, getting connected with um, community benefits such as CalFresh food stamps, that sort of thing. Um, that's what we're here for. We're here to help connect you to all of that. So um, please reach out to me. I'm, I'm the case manager here and we can make an appointment for me to meet with you. We can do an assessment of your situation. Um, and I can sort of do a one-on-one -on -one with you on how to improve your social circles and um, invest into those um, opportunities. Another thing I just like to throw out there is, you know, sometimes, you know, she men mentioned in her presentation, um, we lose some connections socially due to um, family um, issues or whatever. I'm, I'm, I always encourage people to reevaluate those issues and see if forgiveness can be um, injected into those situations and sort of reinvest in those past relationships because you may, might have had a relationship with a family member for years, some, you had a falling out, and you know you still had those great times before that falling out that you guys could focus on if you could just get past that falling out. You know? um, and I can help with that as well, talk you through it. Um, and um, Because it's, like I said, it's important to invest in these relationships for them to benefit you in the long run. Um, and that's what we're here for. So um, um, I could go on about the housing, low-income housing, but I am doing a presentation on March 9th. Um, um, I invite you all to participate. I'm gonna get into detail about the differences between the different types of section eight low-income housing as opposed to um, uh, private nonprofit low-income housing and how you qualify, all that sort of stuff because it can be very confusing. Um, and uh, um, I'm here to sort of uh, um, unconfuse you <laughs> about how, how, to, how to navigate that whole system. So please reach out to me. Again, my name is Thomas King. I'm the social work case manager at Avenidas, and my contact information is in the chat. Um, and I look forward to talking to you. Thanks, Thomas. That was, uh, <clears throat> it, it's, it's so wonderful that you have these resources for people here on the peninsula. Uh, not everybody's that lucky. 
for those of you that aren't on the peninsula, there's great home sharing information at um, a site called Silver Nest, silvernest.com. Also, uh, Thomas, you may actually be interested in this too, if you haven't discovered Anna Marie Pluhar um, out of Vermont, who, who wrote a book on home sharing. And within that book, I think there are ways to make that happen um, in, in such a way that you make agreements about things that will be important to you. Uh, she's, she's a good resource as well. But home sharing, home sharing is a, a terrific thing. And I also encourage those of you who, who just don't think that you're going to make it in this area to, and, and you're still at a point in your life where you are strong and healthy and can make a move to consider doing that. Consider other kinds of, of senior living. I don't have the, the time here to go through all of the options for senior living there, but if you are someone who is considering one of the beautiful senior living um, opportunities, both in the Bay Area and elsewhere around the country, the American Society for, no, American Senior Housing Association, ASHA, A-S-H-A, has a great consumer website that talks about all of the different kinds of senior housing that's out there and helps uh, help you define some of the terms that you'll hear bantered around when you, when you look at senior housing options. So that's what I want to say about housing in this short time we have. Um let me just add to this because we're, we're getting some uh, questions about very uh, specific details about home sharing and taxing and taxes and all of that stuff. We will continue to have these workshops. And when I send you these surveys, I really want to hear more of the details of what, what services would be of helpful to you because then we can create groups and see how many of you out there want to look at housing or want to look at travel and, and what your interests are. And the only way I'm gonna know is if you really do respond to my surveys because I really do respond to what you say to create these programs. Today's come out of a lot of discussion about so aging, but I wanna just talk a little bit about um, some of what both Thomas and Sarah were talking about being with other people and what that means. Cause I've been doing it now for 11 years. Um, so I live over in East Palo Alto. I wasn't gonna talk about this, but I've decided uh, I think it's important. So I, I didn't create this community. I moved into a community that three friends created and they did, they came together on their own. They were, they had been married, they were divorced and they created their own, their own community. And they had hoped to be half co-owners, but because it was expensive, that didn't happen. It's a rental community. They have housed and provided low income housing because that was their goal to over 70 people since they created this in the 90s. Now there are other people doing very similar things in our area. So if you were to Google intentional communities, just intentional communities, that that's the umbrella term for these kind of communities and they're very different. So if for instance, four of you who have funding decided to buy two acres and build on it and then create your own real village, that is a possibility because that's what these people did. And so there is a magazine called Intentional Communities, and you can read about these communities, which are actually worldwide. There are some in Europe where artists or people into baking, organic living. There's one, one of the oldest ones in Tennessee, which is all about um, the environment. And a lot of them now, there are younger people moving their families into them, but they also are intergenerational. So there are these intentional communities in every state with people who are um, primarily uh, supporting the environment and living a certain sustainable lifestyle, but it's a multi-generational. Now in Berkeley, there's a co-housing with uh, this couple I was talking about, Rains Cone, and they've been together over 25 years. So they have people within their housing complex that they're helping now who are in hospice. And so there's just many ways to navigate this. Um, and it's a lot of it is online. You can call me, um, post it on the website. If you if you on the Avenues website and you scroll to Care Partners, which um, the way the website is right now, there's a lot of videos posted but at the very end of the website. If you scroll all the way down, you'll, you'll find the different programs. 
And so Avenida has many programs. And so Care Partners is um, where you find the links for Thomas and I, our phone numbers, our email addresses. And, and uh, we also run an information and assistance line. I posted it in the chat line and call us with your questions and, and we will call you back within a day or two. Right now with the pandemic still going on, we kind of, um, we have priority crisis calls and clients we are dealing with, but we do get back to everybody who calls us and we keep an Excel spreadsheet on every single phone call so we can see how each other is doing with the callbacks. But we are here to help you. Now, one of the questions that keep coming up, Sarah, Thomas, I wanna to get to is about conservatorships and durable power, durable power of attorneys. And so we do have seminars with lawyers and we bring them on to talk about um, just this. And so basically I think the way this goes is when you create your elder state package your durable power of attorney forms, there are three people you designate on the durable powers, which are two forms. One is decision-making for health. One is decision-making for finances. You have three slots. And you want to choose trusted, reliable people who you know will be in your life. Or even if they move, they can still be called. They can still be contacted um, to make decisions in case you cannot make a decision. Now, that could be a temporary situation where you've been in a car accident, but you're going to recover. But you want to have trusted people talking about and, and they know what your preferences are. So that means a copies of your advanced directive, your five wishes, however you document how you want uh, treatment, your health care to go, you need to document it and make sure each one of these three people have it and that they all know each other. I always say, have everybody in your personal support teams know each other. You can use Zooms or phones, however, but they need to meet each other, especially if it's a uh, adult child and a friend who maybe have never met. Um, so those are durable power of attorneys and you have to set them up and keep them in place while you are competent. If you get to a point of being confused and you have not done this, those forms are not available to you. Uh, it's not kosher for a lawyer or a friend to have you sign or have you sign those because it um, can be questioned in a court. And then what happens if you don't have one and you become confused, I have some clients right now, uh, and you have nobody taking care of you and you are seen wandering, you are um, found down in your home, the police will take you to the emergency room at the hospital and you may necessarily, you may be hospitalized because um, you're an elder adult at risk. And so they put you in the hospital until the social workers in the hospital file a petition with the county courts for a representative to come out from the county court to act on your behalf and represent you. But if you are declared lacking competency by two doctors, then they're going to have to go to court in your honor and get you a court appointed conservator who has signed up for this job. And they then are your decision maker. They have your civil rights in their heart. They're going to decide where you're going to go, if you have money, how to spend it. And if you need assisted memory care or nursing home care, what that looks like, they become your decision maker. And if you want to prevent that from happening in your life, you have to, while confident, find your three folks to be your durable power attorneys for health and for financial decision making. It's two separate decision making pieces. And when you're evaluated for competency, it's two different tests because it's different parts of our brains that make these types of decisions. So usually the financial decision making, if you're developing dementia, is going to go first. Uh, analytical, those types of functions. And what goes later on is your decision to, um, uh, you can retain a lot of what you're feeling about what you want about your body. Now, there is a free testing site for any of you who are brave enough and want to go do what I call baseline testing. And many of my clients have, and they have fun with it. So you can um, Google this and somebody can write this in the chat line. It's the, if you know, it's the Stanford slash VA for Veterans Administration, Stanford VA, and they call it the Alzheimer's Research Center. So the beauty of this is it's completely free. It's state-of-the-art testing. I know the neurologist who's doing it. He's done a town hall video, which is on our website on testing and competency. So you can get some baseline testing done, and they will then do the cognitive status exam to determine whether or not you have a mild or more advanced cognitive change in a diagnosis of dementia, if that's what they find. 
and they do testing for competency. So they do the separate tests for healthcare financial decision making and for um, for healthcare decision making and for financial decision making. Now, some of you who are not quote solo agers but are caring for somebody who is changing might want to have your person do this because that's how you activate your durable power of attorney if you become the proxy decision making for somebody you care about and you're you're their designated durable power of attorney you have to have these letters by the doctors to activate the durable power of attorney now this is all complicated i didn't mean to get into it that much but i think it relates to solo aging and it's an important piece of this puzzle have you, how you navigate to understand why it's important to get the durable power of attorney done while you can. And, um, and so Stanford, all of our, our health providers are supposed to do cognitive testing with, so whether you're with Kaiser, they have the aging and memory clinic, the Stanford senior care clinic, um, the Stanford VA testing, Dr. Ayati, who has a second opinion in the clinic in Los Altos, his name is A-Y-A-T-I, he does testing. But because the pandemic kept us kind of all in our homes for two years, people are now swamping them coming in for these, uh, these testing procedures. So you have to be patient and it's great to sign up now because you may be given an appointment three to four months from now. Um, okay. So let's see if there's some other questions. In the I chat have some comments about DPOA about I'd like to say, Paul, is sure. that okay? Um, sure. So I just wanna make people aware of how, how to get a DPOA if, um, uh, because you don't necessarily need to go to an attorney to get a DPOA. Um, if, you, if you have a family member, friend, or somebody that you trust to be your DPOA for health or finance, um, you can actually download a form off of the internet, a DPOA form. Um, and on that form, you're gonna, there's going to have all these boxes of what you're giving this person authority to um, make decisions for you in the, in the instance that you can't make it yourself. You just go through this form, you fill out, check out all the boxes, then you take that form um, to a notary. And um, then the notary is going to ask the person giving, um, uh, giving authority um, to the DPOA to read the document in front of the notary and make sure that the, they understand what they're signing. And then they sign it in front of the notary, the notary notarizes it. Then you have that document to take to wherever, wherever it's appropriate. So if you say you, um, you, you're in the hospital, you can't take care of your bills, you need somebody to turn off your cable or whatever. If you had the durable power of um, finance, for somebody, you could call the cable company, fax them a copy, say, I have the authority to turn off their cable or whatever. Um, and I want to make it clear that the durable power of attorney is not an absolute power. What that is, is you're giving somebody else the ability to make decisions for you in your absence, but that does not override your, your decision um, making uh, power like a conservatorship does. A conservatorship gives the power to the conservator taking the power away from you, the authority away from you to make your own decision. DPOAs do not do that. They just add another person to the authority, um, which you can rescind at any time. Um, if you sign a DPOA with somebody and then you decide that person's no good, you can rip that up and it's no good no more. They have no authority. You have the, you have the uh, authority to rescind it. Um, the, uh, the exception to the online DPOA is for banking. If you um, if you need to do somebody's banking, you would need they would need to take you to the bank, and then the bank will have their own durable a power of attorney form for you to fill out that's specific to their bank. So banks won't accept the one that you download off the internet, but most other um, companies and stuff that you deal with financially will. Um, same thing with the the um, durable power of attorney for health. Um, you can go ahead and. Uh, do the online one for that. And that will help you with the, uh, making decisions for people like for caregivers and whatnot. But typically, if you're gonna go to a hospital, they're gonna have their own DPOA for you to fill out for their hospital. So I guess in, in summary, for your general needs, you can just download a document, have it signed, notarized, and that's gonna get, get you through dealing with uh, nor, uh, your normal community vendors and whatnot. But if you're gonna deal with a bank or hospital system, 
you're going to need to go through that bank or hospital system um, and fill out their DPOA. Thomas, thank you. Uh, Thomas, you good, great points. And so just to quarterback Thomas, because some more questions came came uh, from people who know nothing about this. And I know some of you know a lot about this, so I want to ask for your patience. So the durable power attorney forms are forms that you keep on file. Where do they go? They go to your doctor's office. They go in your medical chart. They go to your designated durable power of attorneys, your three people who are listed. They all should have copies. Maybe they go to your trusted neighbor so that if you are found down and the police come and you see the police, you go running over and say, here, officer, take that to the hospital. This is a list of their durable power of attorneys. I say everybody needs to have a command central station in their home. And here's where you have it, command central. You have your legal documents. You have the front and back of your insurance cards copied. Uh, uh, you have somebody with a list in today's world of all your computer codes. Because if you should be found down, and we all know people who have had heart attacks, strokes, things happen. All of this information needs to be accessible to your attorney, your doctors, and your emergency contacts. Um, and so I will, again, we talk about this a lot and you can call me, you can call Thomas and we'll help you think through these things. But the type of forms you use really depend on the extent of your estate. So for those who have several properties, funds, investments, you're going to want to do this with an elder state attorney. You're not, want, you're not going to want to download a form offline because you want an attorney to guide you on, on all of this. It gets very, very complicated. For those of us who are living on our social security and may have a car, don't own any property, um, the, the forms offline should be just fine. But I always recommend you don't do any of this alone. And you always have somebody who in your circle that you know, just kind of look at what you are signing on to. Because whether you are moving into an assisted or memory care, hiring home care, bringing somebody in your house to work for you, doing anything involving contract or an exchange of services, you, you don't want to navigate this alone, OK? Um, and it's a the each of these subset discussions, whether it's housing or the GPOA, are their own Zoom topics. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll keep returning to these. Um, so let's see what other questions have popped up here. Um, um, OK. Now, about companies who act, as, it's not really, quote, a, there's not a, a company. So, there are professional associations. So there are fiduciaries. There's a professional association of fiduciaries. Uh, if you just Google that, perfect. And those are people who are trained to do bill paying and help people in need of that kind of support because we, we don't have a trusted family member to turn your bill paying over to. So there, so, um, so there is that professional association of fiduciaries. The conservator situation requires uh, a court process. You have, a person has to be designated by the court to become your conservator, and that can be you. I mean, if you want to, um, you have a loved one who's confused and they didn't assign you as a durable power attorney, then actually what tends to happen is families go to an elder state attorney and one who specializes in conservatorship and you petition the county court to become that person's conservator and you go through that process which is a very expensive process to go through if you have to do it privately. I've had some clients having to do, to do it, some of my caregivers, because the durable power of attorneys uh, forms were not done correctly or they never did them. Um, and so the durable power, if you use a, an attorney for durable power, because you do have property, that could be a few thousand dollars. But if you use, if you have to do the conservatorship process, it's many thousands of dollars. Thank you for, for posting some of the links I talk about as I'm talking. Um, okay, so let's see timing-wise, where are we at, Sarah? How are we doing here? <laughs> We're way <Two> over. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, um, well, I'm glad you hit on <clears throat> some of the things that I rarely have time to hit on until the questions and you guys are so capable of answering them. Um, these are all, all the, all of the elements you've been talking about, especially the 
the powers of attorney having those proxies for health and for finances are are so critical and that's why we just need each other we need to come together as each other's resources uh, throughout a 30 or 40 year age span so that we will have the people to rely on and i i also love thomas's comment about don't ignore the, the the nieces and nephews that you may have they may not be close family but it may definitely not be too late to cultivate a relationship with them, especially if they live nearby. Um, and the one thing I always love to mention is just start having the conversations. Just start talking to whatever family members you do have and the friends that you have. Start talking about solo aging. Start talking about the options that, that you might take advantage of together. It, it won't happen until you start talking about it, until you start communicating about it. And, and if I might mention it too, for those of you, I'm sure there's some of you out there who are saying, well, I don't have any family. I don't have any friends. I know you're saying cultivate these relationships, but there's none for me to cultivate. And, I, and I'm sorry that you're in that situation. Um, for, for people like that, um, there are professionals that you can reach out to to help you navigate um, the aging process. Um, Avenidas, we do short-term uh, case management, um, but for long-term, if you have the financial means, you can hire professional case managers um, that are going to be able to help you with all of this, um, connecting you with uh, fiduciaries, um, uh, transportation, home care, all that sort of stuff um, in, in in lieu of you having family members or friends to help you with that. So um, I just wanna address those people out there who might feel a little left out who say, well, I don't have these, these relationships to cultivate. Um, again, feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, I'll put my um, email in the chat right now again. Um, I can help connect you to those resources. Um, if, uh, if, uh, if I can't help you as a case manager, I will refer you to the appropriate um, agency that would be uh, able to help you in the long term. Thanks, Thomas. Um, so many of the staff at Avenues are very involved with providing support to anybody who's feeling alone. We have a Chinese cultural community center. We have Thomas now with the LGBTQ programs. Um, I am trying to start looking at intergenerational programming and partnering with Stanford staff. I provide counseling to Stanford staff, but I am thinking about trying to expand into creating intergenerational programs because students, especially students in the world of technology, really want to meet with older adults and help working. So there's, there's ways to volunteer and link and be of service to the future. I call it us raising the future through our intergenerational intergenerational relationships. Now, what we're gonna be doing is we'll be surveying you. We'll be sending this information. This whole discussion will be posted online on the Avenida's website and all of our previous videos are online. So they are about many, many, many various topics including testing, dementia, uh, Zooms. We, have, we do Zooms with lawyers and we do those about every three months. We do Zooms about DPOAs. Uh, next month, I have a long-term care expert coming on for a Zoom about how do you look at the whole crazy conglomeration of health insurance, long-term care insurance, Medicare choices. She's an expert in this, and, and we will just keep focusing on, on these topics. So, Christina, what would you like to say? I'm throwing it to you at this point. Um, I just want to say thank you to all for, well, for all of the attendees and all of your great questions, as I think we knew, I, I think it really hit home that everybody is in just such a different situation based on a million factors. <laughs> um, and just thank you to Sarah for coming on and sharing your knowledge and ideas for uh, successfully aging, um, not alone. Um, regardless of, of who you have close by, um, and Thomas and Paula um, for sharing resources. Um, yeah, we'll be posting, uh, I will be sending out a survey by the end of the day. Um, please take a quick look at that. It will also have information on 
uh, our contact information, as well as uh, we'll see what time I get the link for the video, but if not today, I'll be sending out the link uh, shortly as well. We good? Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.